Hey, what's up, everybody? It's probably been quite a while since you've last heard from me. About seven months, to be exact. But the reason I kept taking these longer than intended breaks was basically for me to finish up high school, which I actually ended up doing not that long ago in the most funniest way possible, too, if you want to go check out the numerous videos on my other channel. But enough said, I'm still transdimensional. And well, before we start everything, I just want to thank you guys so much because it's incredible that all of you have subscribed to my channel while I was away. Meaning that if you're new and not already subscribed, then maybe you could possibly be that 1%. Okay, maybe I dragged this on for too long. If you like this video, then subscribe and leave a like. Well, that's all I gotta say. I hope we're caught up now and just enjoy this video. Because it might have taken me seven months to make. Now, Ash is a character who I've covered many times before, but in my version of his team, I choose for him to still catch his original six Pokemon, and all in the same order as seen on the show. By this point, Ash has earned his three original badges, as he's now traveling along Brock and Misty. Just like in the original show! <laughs> Trust me guys, I know what I'm doing. Things go normally for Ash. He has a questionable Pokemon battle with a Krabby, but surprisingly catching it, and learning that he can't hold more than six Pokemon. Here is where we start to change some things. See, in my version of Ash's team, he still releases his Butterfree. But unlike in the main series, Butterfree is still Ash's Pokemon and can come back at any time to help Ash in battle. Ash will soon be motivated to catch more Pokemon, and this is when he meets a wild Mankey. Brock still gives him a donut before Ash decides to throw a Pokeball at him, catching the donut. Yes, makes total sense. But in this timeline, Ash listens to Misty and weakening the Mankey first. And with that done, he catches the Mankey and not a primate. Since Mankey isn't as strong, Ash doesn't participate in the Grand Prix and thus never gets his Pokemon stolen by Anthony. Unlike Primate, Mankey actually listens to Ash and plays a major role in his gym battle with Erica. After deciding not to catch Muck back in Gringy City and skipping the Safari Zone entirely, the next changes to his team are when Charmander evolves into Charmeleon, then again into Charizard. But of course he still disobeys Ash. Some things just never change. In this timeline, Ash's battle with Blaine goes a little differently. Instead of him using Pikachu, Ash actually uses his brain and has Krabby transferred over instead. Krabby evolves into Kingler in the middle of battling Ninetales and takes him out. Rhydon is able to knock out Kingler though, but when Ash sends out Charizard, he chooses not to battle. Squirtle, who hasn't been used yet, uses his small size and type advantage to get the jump on Rhydon, knocking him out. Magmar gets sent out last, and Charizard chooses to battle Magmar, as he's a worthy fire type. The rest is kind of history. Giovanni still ends up leaving his gym to Jesse and James, but in this timeline, they get defeated a little quicker as Ash's Mankey evolves into Primeape, and still, Primeape is obedient to Ash, as he's had more time to train him as a Mankey. Nothing with the Indigo League is noticeably different. Ash's Kingler still wipes through Mandy's team, but during Squirtle's battle with Nidorino, he evolves into War Turtle, thus winning Ash's second round. Even though Ash has stronger Pokemon in this timeline, he still loses to Richie, as they're still all unable to battle after having to deal with Team Rocket throughout the whole day. Yup, Charizard still gets Ash disqualified in the worst league loss ever. Wait, Unova exists. Never mind. We now follow Ash into the Orange Islands. In this timeline, Ash would still leave his new Pidgeot behind, but the other Pidgeotto there would have urged Ash's Pidgeot to follow its trainer, leaving Ash to keep Pidgeot in his party. The story with Ash's Lapras is roughly the same, the only difference being that Primate was switched out as he was seemingly Ash's strongest Pokemon at the time, and he felt that his other Pokemon never really got the spotlight. With Primate back at Oak's lab, Ash uses his other Pokemon for his Orange Island battles. This is when Charizard begins to obey Ash, with Wartortle also evolving into Blastoise around that same time. Now at this point, Ash has received the 4 badges needed to battle in the league. Here he faces off against Drake. With Ash not catching 30 Tauros in this timeline, he has to call into Professor Oak and have his Primeape transferred for his Pidgeot. Drake and Ash's battle plays out the same. With Ash winning, of course. But even in this timeline, Ash has some pretty strong Pokemon. And just like that, the league is over. Lapras and Tracy disappear, and Ash, Brock, and Misty now head off to the Johto region.
Ah, Johto. A land of, um, basically Kanto, with new Pokemon. Nonetheless, Ash's first capture of the region is Heracross. Look, in every timeline it's Heracross. I love this bug. Ash is once again contacted by Professor Oak, this time about needing assistance in his lab. Ash thinks before sending over his Bulbasaur to assist, a move he later ends up doing later on in the main show. While talking to Professor Oak, Ash gets the tip about a flying type gem located in Violet City and decides to transfer in his primate for his Pidgeot. He battles Faulkner viciously with his Heracross and Pidgeot, but after Heracross falls to Faulkner's Pidgeot, Ash sends out his Pidgeot for a Pidgeot vs Pidgeot. Yeah, Pidgeot later gets transferred back to Oak's lab though. The story with Ash catching Chikorita is relatively the same. Nothing really changed there. Oh no! They slipped away! That's not funny! Sorry. <laughs> With Chikorita added to the team, the next major change comes when Ash feels obligated to leave his Charizard to train with Lisa in the Char Civic Valley. Charizard still gets released in this timeline relatively the same way. Nothing really different there. Cyndaquil also ends up getting added to Ash's team not long after, on his way to Azalea Town. And it's here where Ash's gym battle with Bugsy is played out easier for Ash, as his Blastoise and Cyndaquil wipe through her team, earning Ash the Hive Badge. The next change comes when Blastoise meets back up with his Squirtle squad. They try and persuade Blastoise to rejoin their new firefighting group, but after evolving from Squirtle, Blastoise respects Ash way too much to leave, and Blastoise remains with Ash in this timeline, causing for no goodbye. Now when this usual duel comes for Totodile, Ash will still win, but he'll later give Totodile's Pokeball to Misty, as he naturally felt bad for Misty and the fact that he already has an overpowered water type in Blastoise. Ash will have made his way through the next few gems, but in this reality, Ash never takes the chance to catch the shiny Noctowl, and thus uses the Cyndaquil a lot more in these gem battles. And through that, he gets the experience and evolves into Koalava. Oh yeah. Chikorita also evolves earlier than in the main show, evolving into Bayleaf, winning Ash the Storm Badge. Okay, so in this timeline, Ash never obtains Fanfy's egg, because it's around the same time that Ash comes across a wild Scizor, which he proceeds to battle with his hair across, of course. It ends up being a rough battle, but Scizor is weak enough for Ash to throw a Pokeball, and actually capturing it, adding a strong powerhouse steel type to his Johto team roughly early on. Ash has now battled through the last three gems of Johto, using his wide variety of Pokemon. But in the process, Koalava evolves into Typhlosion, ultimately shocking Ash because he never really thought about evolving his Pokemon. Immediately after this, Ash starts to travel with a recently hatched Larvitar, just like in the regular timeline. But in my version, Larvitar and his mother both choose that being with Ash was just meant to happen. Ash ends up adding Larvitar to his team right before the Silver Conference begins. Ash ends up making it to the Silver Conference. His battles are quicker and eventually it comes down to the Gary vs. Ash in the top 16. Ash brings back his Primeape and Charizard just to make the 6 on 6 just insane as it already was. We still have many of the intense battles with Primeape now beating the senses out of Gary's Nido Queen. But that final battle though still plays out the same with Charizard's signature seismic toss on Blastoise ending the battle in Ash's favor. Now in this timeline, Ash still advances to the top 8 and fights Harrison. Ash knows the battle will be tough as Harrison is from Hoenn, a region Ash knows nothing about. The night before Ash's battle with Harrison, he goes on a walk, seemingly nervous about his battle, but he stops and turns to see his Butterfree approaching him in the distance. He knows that it's his Butterfree as the yellow ribbon Brock tied around his neck is still there. He's returned to help Ash battle Harrison in the Silver Conference. Harrison still ends up being extremely powerful. Butterfree is able to put up a fight, that until Blaziken knocks him out. But it's Butterfree who weakens Blaziken enough for Charizard to be the last one standing. You know, unlike in the original timeline. With Ash's shocking win against Harrison, he's now in the top 4, with his next battle against John Dixon. In the normal timeline, John is the one who actually wins the Silver Conference, if you're confused about that. Butterfree eventually returns to its family, while Ash has his Johto team return to him as well. The next battle is somewhat a mystery as John is only revealed to own a Rhyhorn and a Rapidash, but he's known to at least own 4 other Pokemon. I'm just gonna say this, Ash battled his hardest, but John was just too prepared. After watching Ash battle Gary and Harrison, Ash ends up losing to John. And John goes on to win the Johto League, okay whatever, Ash is sad, blah blah blah, Hoenn. 
Ash arrives in Hoenn the same, dumping all his Pokemon and starting anew. Hey, also May! Use water gun! <laughs> Almost nothing really changes with Ash's early Hoenn team. You know, he still catches Taylor and Trico. But it's around Ash's time on Dufred Island when he comes across a wild Bagon. Still excited at every Gen 3 Pokemon he sees, Ash goes for a battle and captures the surprisingly weak Bagon. Not long after the addition of Bagon, Corefish also gets added to the team, just as he does in the normal timeline. Also having filled up his team rather early, Ash chooses not to catch Torkoal while passing through the Valley of Steel. Now at this point, Ash has 4 badges, and is on his way to his 5th. Trico evolves into Grovile as normal, which actually helps Ash in taking down Norman. Taillu evolves, but the next big change comes when Ash trains his Pokemon between his gym battles. After Corfish wins a practice battle against Bagon, he's revealed to have gained enough experience to evolve into Crawdon, leaving everyone shocked from the surprising evolution. Ash now feels like his Hoenn team has gotten stronger, and that's all except for Bagon. Ash will go ahead and use Bagon more frequently as he battles through the last gems of Hoenn. Despite being weak, Bagon will actually end up shocking Ash as he evolves midway through his gym battle with Juan. While Ash and friends are now making their way towards the Hoenn League, a wild Zangoose comes running up to confront the group. Pikachu is able to make quick work of the Zangoose, and as the weakened Zangoose just lays there, Ash decides to catch it. Ash arrives at the Hoenn League, and everything in the beginning is the same. The first change to the league surprisingly comes when Ash battles Tyson. Now in the regular timeline, Ash loses. But in my version, Ash's stronger Pokemon are able to bring down Metagross a lot quicker. With Ash now in the top 4, it's tough to say what comes next, as Tyson wins the league normally. Ash has some strong Pokemon though, and I'm gonna say he makes it the top 2. But his next opponent, being a mystery trainer? That trainer is revealed to be Brendan. Okay, Brendan has actually appeared before in the anime, being only in the opening credits of multiple movies. That's where he's shown to own some powerful Hoenn Pokemon though. Now Ash and Brendan's battle is long, and equal in the beginning. That's until Brendan brings out his Rhyperior as his last Pokemon. Ash is really confused, as he's clearly never seen a Rhyperior before. He only has one Pokemon left, and that's his Pikachu. But Rhyperior defeats Pikachu easily, making Brendan the winner of the Hoenn League. Ash is, of course, sad, but secretly proud, as this is the farthest he's made it in a league before. As per normal, Ash leaves Hoenn and returns to Kanto. There he learns about the Battle Frontier and decides to compete. And since Ash doesn't own Fanfy in this timeline, Larvitar would actually be the one that follows Ash instead, rejoining the team while Swallow is left behind at Oak's lab. With those changes out of the way, a good amount of the Battle Frontier plays out normally, but now Ash has other powerful Pokemon like Primeape and Pidgeot. Charizard still is the one defeating legendaries though. No, not for this one. During one of Team Rocket's schemes, Larvitar sends them but has now gained enough experience to evolve into Pupitar. And now as a Pupitar, it struggles to move around and it basically has to learn again, being kind of useless. Now, Ash is halfway through the battle frontier, and just like in the normal timeline, Grovile evolves into Sceptile, before getting totally friendzoned by a Meganium. After some more of Ash's old Pokemon return, Shogun finally evolves into Salamance during Ash's first battle with Brandon and his Registeel. Even though Salamance is no longer a weak little Bagon, Registeel still polarizes him. It's okay though, Ash still has a rematch with Brandon, bringing back his original Kanto Pokemon. But in this timeline, Butterfree is among the team after rejoining Ash during his campout that he decides to go on. Ash's rematch is long and hard, but the battle ends the same, with Pikachu defeating Reggie Ice. <laughs> All of Ash's original Pokemon now head off. Charizard returns to training, Bulbasaur and Blastoise chill with Oak, and Butterfree returns to his family. Ash would eventually turn down the position of Frontier Brain, and that leads us to Terracotta Town. Oh, you probably don't know where that is. More commonly known as the town where Ash battled May. It's in my version though where Pupitar is Ash's last Pokemon and almost costs Ash the match. That's until he evolves into Tyranitar and wins Ash the battle. And before you know it, May and Max are back off to Hoenn while Ash now embarks off to the Sinnoh region. Welcome to Sinnoh. Ash arrives all the same with Dawn being introduced as well. Pikachu is lost for like a second, but that's where we get Ash's first Sinnoh capture. 
yeah, it's still a Starly. It's in this alternate Diamond and Pearl timeline though, where Ash never has a chance to meet Turtwig. It's because he was way too busy chasing after an Eevee, catching the Pokemon as a sort of tribute to Mei. But I think he's secretly always wanted a Vaporeon. I don't know, that's for you to decide. With an Eevee now on his Sinnoh team, the next catch for him comes with Paul's Chimchar. Ash yoinks Chimchar onto his team, just like normal. Around the same time, in Har Home City to be exact, Dawn's Piplup befriends a shiny Piplup, and after Ash finds out the Piplup has no trainer, he doesn't miss his chance and quickly adds it to his team. Starly's still first to evolve, but Ash adds a Ryolu to his team, taking quick interest in wanting to catch the Pokemon. After Ash destroys Crasher Wake, he finally presents Ash with the Water Stone he's wanted. But Ash has also been given the Leaf Stone from Gardena that he's held on to. Even though Ash still really badly wants a Vaporeon, he ultimately lets Eevee pick the stone. He ends up choosing Leaf. It's throughout Ash's next gym battles where his Piplup evolves into Prinplup, becoming slightly stronger. Ash's Chimchar also evolves the same, but now earlier than in the main show. Ash's bond with his Ryolu grows over the last few gems. Ash gets reminded about his aura sense that he actually has from a while back, and Ryolu ends up sensing this too, evolving into Lucario, becoming probably one of Ash's strongest Pokemon at the time. This is also around the time where Ash met everyone's favorite Gibble. Ash can't resist catching it in this timeline either, swapping it out for his Leafeon. As Ash makes it through the last gem, Monferno evolves into Infernape as Prinplup evolves slightly after. The two are now stronger than ever and ready to take down Paul. Making it to the Sinnoh League, Ash brings back many of his old Pokemon for his early battles until eventually reaching his battle with Paul, still using his own Infernape against him. Ash wins against Paul and is placed in the top 4, but on the normal timeline, this is where Tobias comes in. Not even an alternate universe can stop this dude. Since Ash has stronger Pokemon, Tobias's Latios gets knocked out, with Tobias's third Pokemon being revealed. That Pokemon is revealed to be a Cresselia. Yeah, the rest of Ash's team doesn't stand a chance. Ash's placing in the Sinnoh League doesn't end up changing that much, and you can thank Tobias for that. Ash has gotten used to the constant league losses, and just like that, Dawn is off, and so is Brock. <laughs> no seriously, just like in the regular timeline, Brock has been with Ash the longest, and really says something about how far Ash has come, especially in my timeline. If it wasn't for Brock, Ash wouldn't have most of the Pokemon that he would have. Ash begins his journey in Unova. But Ash's Unova journey is about to play out a little differently. It turns out that Ash's Gibble snuck aboard the plane and is on his way to Unova as well. But it's when Ash is distracted by a fish for Gibble to take his time to jump from the plane and straight onto Ash's head. Ash recovers and adds Gibble back to his team. And now skipping ahead a little bit, Ash meets Iris, and she's impressed that Ash owns a Gibble. Gibble has even seen annoying Axew through the first few episodes. Ash easily makes it through the first few gems of Unova, but in this timeline, he catches significantly less Pokemon. By this point, he's only captured Oshawa, Tepig, and Scraggy. We're now at Ash's gym battle with Elisa. Gibble is Ash's only Pokemon left and it manages to take down Elisa's Tynamo and Zebstrika. Gibble is definitely shown to have gained a ton more experience than he had back in Sinnoh. Tepig evolves rather earlier in my timeline. Ash also catches another Unova Pokemon, and that's a Litwick. Ash and Trip now have their first official battle. Ash, you know, plays it dumb and ends up with only his Gibble left. Trip sends out his Vanillite knowing this. And even though it's a small Pokemon, the Ice-type almost knocks Gibble out, but he evolves into Gabite. Vanillite still knocks him out though. After Ash ventures past the next two gyms, Scraggy evolves into Scrafty, becoming a super strong Dark-type. It's also in my timeline, Ash will finally get the chance to catch the Sandile with the sunglasses. Ash ends up replacing Oshawa out for Sandile, since Oshawa still has his downfalls. Sandile ends up being really strong, even evolving during Ash's gym battle with Bryson. And just to set the record straight, that was the Pokemon's first battle. 
It's now Ash's last gym battle in Unova against Roxy for the Toxic Badge. Pig Knight and Gabite are the ones who take out most of her team, with Pig Knight now being able to evolve into Imbor by the end of the battle. Before heading to the league, Ash has a battle with Drayden at Iris' home dragon village. Ash makes sure to use his Gabite. As Drayden sends out his Dredigan, he knows this is going to be a fair dragon fight. The battle definitely isn't easy for Gabite, but it sees Iris' Dragonite watching from the side. Gabite gives it his everything and evolves in the Garchomp, seemingly just to prove itself. The dragon battle, though, ends in a draw. The Unova League, I guess? Still plays out mostly the same. Ash's Garchomp gets to be shown off, while Krokorok finally evolves on the Crocodile. Since Ash only ends up keeping the same 6 Pokemon, Cameron still ends up winning, even though he brought 5 Pokemon. Do I really care anymore? It's been 16 seasons. No. Now that Ash has wrapped up the league, him and his friends are off within. And I want to touch on this moment for a second. Ash still recounts his stories with Charmander, and eventually all the battles they still share. Eventually, Ash still has his Charizard sent over from the Johto region, and after sharing a battle, Charizard returns to Ash's team. Okay now, Ash and everybody leaves Unova, travel some islands, meet up with Alexa, and eventually make it back to Kanto. And everybody says goodbye, and Ash gets ready for his next adventure. Ash is in the Kalos region, a really interesting region for my timeline I admit, because Ash's first captures are Froki and Litleo. Having a fire type already, Ash doesn't see the need to catch a fleshling. Battling through a few gems already, Ash adds Halucha to his team in relatively the same fashion. I have to add though, in this reality, Ash would have already caught a Skiddo by now. It still takes some time, but Froki evolves into Frogadier all the same. But it would be through the next few gems, where Ash only uses his Litleo. Litleo definitely benefits from all the gym battles. By the time Ash has his battle with Ramos, he's ready to evolve. With the Pyroar now on Ash's team, he's now ready for his gym battle with Clement. Ash's Skiddo actually does most of the hard hitting, and Ash feels its determination to battle for sure. It's around this time when yes, just like in the normal timeline, Ash adds the little Noibat to his team. Now having a full team of 6, Ash has no trouble in taking down Valerie and Olympia. And sometime after these gym battles, Skiddo evolves in the Go-Goat. And Ash just can't resist on not taking Go-Goat out for a ride. This is also around the same time when Ash would get his strongest Pokemon yet, but he doesn't know it yet. By this point, everything else in Kalos plays out the same. Ash's Noibat evolves, he defeats Wolfrig, and eventually makes it to the league. Here we get to see Ash's regular timeline battles, being against Sawyer and the famous battle against Alon. Ash ends up placing second and Alon ends up winning the league. Is what normally happens. In my timeline, Ash's stronger Pokemon guarantee Ash the win. I always felt that Ash just deserves the win in X and Y. Yeah, Lysander still takes over the world or whatever. Eventually, Ash will soon prepare on making his way back to Kanto, and he takes some time to share one more night with all his Pokemon in Lumio City. But it's in my timeline, Greninja doesn't want to leave Ash, and travels back to Kanto with him, as Ash embarks on his next journey. It's by this time that Ash, his mom, and Mr. Mime all go on a vacation to none other than the Alola region, leaving all his Kalos Pokemon behind and beginning anew. And Ash gets his Z bracelet and rolls on the Pokemon school, and yeah, catches his Rowlet. With Ash already receiving his Rotom Pokedex, the first change comes to him when he notices a Litten around the town. But in this timeline, Litten is shiny. The story of Ash catching Rockruff has to be one of my favorites, meaning that it happens in my timeline as well. Catching back up with the shiny Litten, we learn that he's all alone, as the Stoutland died. Hold on, a Pokemon actually died? Yeah gone over this. Ash and Litten still become friends, and it's not long after that Litten is added to the team. It's still at Ash's grand trial battle against Olivia on Akala Island, where after Rockruff evolves into its dusk form Lycanroc. Nothing much changes for the next few episodes. Yeah, that's until Ash and friends take a school trip up to Mount Lanakila. In there, Ash will catch a wild Cabrawler, definitely wanting to add the rambunctious fighting type Pokemon to his team. Not long after, Ash and his class take a field trip to Kanto and get to meet back up with Brock and Misty. When everyone visits Professor Oak's lab, all of Ash's stronger Pokemon appreciate seeing their trainer once again. Brock and Misty still also show off to Ash with their surprising yet strong Mega Evolutions. 
Before leaving Kanto, Ash tells Brock and Misty about his league win, and how he's finally achieved his goal of Pokemon Master. Kukui hears this, and will soon be inspired to initiate the Alola League. Now that Ash is back in Alola, he battles Gladian for the first time, and it's during this battle that Rallet gives it his all. And even though he loses, Rallet evolves into Dartrix. Not long after this, the shiny Litten evolves as well, while fighting Kukui- <sighs> I mean, the Mask Royale's Incineroar. Yeah, it's just like in the regular timeline, where Ash and friends leave Alola to travel the ever-expanding multiverse. Still, in a not-so-distant world, Ash will still capture Poipole. And instead of Poipole returning to its world, you know, after saving it, Poipole decides to stay on Ash's team just a little longer. Since Ash now has a full Alola team, he debates on catching Melton, but eventually does. In this timeline though, Melton isn't used as much, and just chills around Kukui's house. It's now time for Ash's grand trial battle against Nanu. Ash uses his dark tricks in taking out most of Nanu's dark types. But Dartrix now evolves into its more powerful ghost type, that being Decidueye. Wrapping things up, Ash has a final grand trial battle with Hapu, making Ash eligible to enter the newly found Alola League. This is when he thinks for a bit. In my timeline, Ash decides not to participate in the league, wanting to give one of his friends the chance to win, and offers his support to each and every one of them. Since Ash doesn't win the league in this timeline, Kiawe is the one who ends up making it the farthest. The top 2 comes down to Kiawe vs Gladion. Their battle is just as intense as Ash's, with Charizard being the one who takes out Savali. Kiawe ends up winning the league with Ash by his side. After learning about Kukui's secret identity, Ash challenges Kukui to a final battle on the beach, since Ash leaves the next morning. Torakat is paired back up against Incineroar, and instead of losing this time, Torakat comes out on top by evolving into Incineroar, and really proves his strength. Poipo returns back to his home world, and Ash leaves all his Pokemon behind at Kukui's, before finally deciding to travel the world after saying goodbye to his second home of Alola. Ash has now made his way back to Kanto. He reflects on all his many achievements, but now he meets Go. Ash and Go still journey to other regions, like Hoenn, Unova, and even Galar. Yes, a region we've heard nothing about. Ash still gets an iPhone, and catches his totally not overpowered Dragonite, all the same. It's in my timeline though, that Ash's second trip to Galar, ends up with him catching a wild Impidim somewhere in Balanle. Gengar still gets added to Ash's team, but Ryolu does not. Ash sees no need to catch one, as he already owns a Lucario sitting at Professor Oak's. Ash is now back in Kalos, and during Ash's battle against Corina, he uses his Impidim, who evolves into Morgrum after taking a few uncomfortable blows from Mega Lucaria. With Ash being back in the Galar region, saving the world or whatever, he'll actually be the one to catch the wild Groki instead of Go, giving Ash at least one Galar starter. Ash capturing Groki happens exactly around the same time when he catches the Galarian Farfetch'd, in about relatively the same fashion. With Ash still traveling around the world, he still ultimately travels back to Alola, revisiting his old Pokemon and Professor Kukui's new son, Play. You've reached the end of my timeline, as the journeys is still airing, and I don't want to overstep. If you're still watching, I can't thank you enough, and you obviously enjoyed this video, so why not subscribe? Anyway, this has been Transdimensional, and I can't wait to see you again.